<laughs> I don't know. No, that's okay. Uh, um, you know, your pasta, your oatmeal, what what do you want, you know? Actually, the best the best scenario is is your uh, your bass that you caught this morning in the kelp back at La Bufadora that you kept in a burlap sack dragging along the side in the water, or alternately dumped dunked the bass, which you've cleaned because you had a gentle sail, so you got nothing else to do rather than you know tie off the tie off the tiller, set your course more or less, clean the fish, and uh, boil up a pot of rice, chop up your yams, chop up an onion, throw in a bouillon cube, throw in the fish, the uh, filleted fish and the head. Don't want to miss out on all the good stuff in the head, and uh, and make a fish stew. Have your dinner, and then sleeping bag. And, down, down, down goes boat tent. Headlamp, a little bit of uh, uh, John Muir seems to fit. Uh, that, that's what I recommend. <laughs> Walt Whitman, Leaves of Grass. Um, very 19th century. This whole thing is 19th century. It's a 19th century meditation. Um, and so that's sort of the end of the workday. Um, so I, I, already, uh, I already did my sleeping bag sleep thing. Um, I won't tell you about the dreams. Uh, <laughs> morning comes. Watch me. Oh my god, I'm in Baja. Why have I chosen to do this? No, actually, no, no, actually, the, the truth of the matter is, oh my god, can it be purple? Look at these colors. I sailed here. I made this boat. It's pretty remarkable. Don't fall overboard. Get the tent, the boat tent. Oh my god, you forgot to get the you forgot to get the buttons off. It's always something. <laughs> but everything has its place, so you can't be. That's what I love about living in a house. You can always clean up like tomorrow or like, next week or not at all. <laughs> My, uh, my my partner Natasha. <laughs> so the boat tent actually doesn't go there. The boat tent rolls up and goes right here. Every everything everything has its place. There's certain laws, and um, you violate them at your peril. really doing this another day apparently we are okay so we throw the throw the rudder back in the water tie it off actually <coughs> we're a little close to go under sail so we uh row Ocean's a mill pond, you can get a proper glide on um, This design, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but you can see, without going into too much detail, everything sort of flows. And so, without, without it's, it's, not, it's not the galley slave routine, it's just using your body weight, your back, and sort of the length of one's arms, and you sort of just use your own weight and lean back. And, and um, say you're 15 miles off of uh, Isla San Miguel and there's not a breath of wind, you might row for eight hours. You might. And the only way you're going to get there is to keep rowing, which is also kind of part of the meditation. Nothing, I guess, I guess you earn the miles, kind of like bicycle trial. Uh, trial. It's, it is some kind of trial, but it's lovely too. I mean, the the, um, the 
the moments, you know, on on the uh, on the open water, on the deep water, um, in close to little coves. It's it's really quite magical. And then, of course, there's there is that element of having built the thing and so truly knowing it from from bottom up. So we're underway again. Oh, we're getting there. This rope goes through a hole in the top of the mast. Oh, thank you. You, you, don't, you don't have those. You don't have those in Baja. <laughs> and of course, if there's any wind, this whole operation can get very interesting, right? Because you're just one guy and the rudder's tied off and the, you know, oh boy. <laughs> it's all pretty fun. Okay, underway again. So uh, roughly, that's how, that's how you operate this boat. Um, and to go into um, a little bit of the why of it all, um, I guess I would have to um, go back to a period of time where I had a job as a handyman at the Pigeon Point Lighthouse uh, north of Santa Cruz. Um, after college, about whew, eight years ago or so, and um, Pigeon Point is uh, a really neat place. If you're ever driving the coast between Santa Cruz and San Francisco, it's very much worth a stop. There's a, the prominent feature, of course, is the lighthouse there. Um, 18, 1860, no, after Civil War, 1880s, I think it was built. Um, and it's a beautiful structure. And um, on this wind-scoured, rock-shrouded coast, um, it's a prominent feature. It's, it's, it's a point that sticks out. On the south end of the point is, is a deep natural cove um, called Whaler's Cove. And when I was there as a handyman, I just fell in love with the place. It was so tangible, the, the feeling of uh, coastal schooners that used to work the, between Santa Cruz, San Francisco, and farther up to uh, to Oregon and the timber trade and uh, coastal agriculture, the ocean was much easier to, to utilize than, than the land-based uh, modes of transportation. There's historical photographs of, of boats, not exactly like these, but very similar that uh, they, they used at Pigeon Point in, in, uh, from, from this little beach in Whaler's Cove. And I just was mesmerized by the water there. As I mentioned, the prevailing wind in, in California is northwesterly. In Northern California, it's northwesterly with a vengeance. And um, so there'll be this wind-scoured ocean just rolling, you know, white caps. And the lee of the point, the south end of this point, you look out over the water and it's just this ruffled dream, a little, little sunlight sparkle and it's like a, a respite. In, in, uh, if I pronounce that word correct, in, in this in this otherwise horror show of this this ragged wind, and I needed I surfed out there all the time. I'd, I would utilize that same that same ruffled water to surf these kind of like some people might not even call it a surf spot, but they were waves. You just sit by one exposed rock and, and ride for you know maybe over to that that car over there, a good little. It, it wasn't the point break that should have been, but it was these little cove waves, if you can picture that, just these these like zipping little waves. And, and so to live there and to be able to get into this smooth water on a surfboard, never mind the great whites who congregate at Año Nuevo a mile down the coast, um, it was beautiful. And I got this like, kind of like lovesick need for a boat. Um, the problem was, that wasn't the place to build it. So it was just kind of a vision that I, that I nurtured for a while. Um, moving forward, I, I, I write and I, and I uh, attempt to wax lyrical, <laughs> which might not come as a surprise. Um, and uh, my lyrical waxing uh, was, was sufficient, uh, let me say, to um, in, in, in this story that I wrote that got published in the Surfer's Journal. The Surfer's Journal then offered me a position there. Um, they needed editorial help, and uh, I've been to college and know my way around a sentence, and so I was able to do the job. I took the job. That meant coming to San Clemente, 
which isn't Pigeon Point, um, which isn't the rolling coast coast ranges and, and deep oak tree meadows and redwoods and all this romantic stuff. But um, as I've come to realize, it is um, a, a, a lovely place to be all on its own for its own qualities. But what came with coming to San Clemente to work with the Surface Journal was um, was a garage space. This boat is 18 feet long. The garage space was 18 feet, three inches. I had my boat shop. I knew I wanted a boat, I mentioned, from, from Pigeon Point. What boat? I didn't want, I didn't want a, a fiberglass laser. I grew up in Newport Beach, so, um, so I, I've sailed sabots and lasers. I didn't want um, some kind of I wanted that historical thing. I wanted that like John Muir on the water sort of sort of deal. But where are you going to get a 19th century style boat um, except build it yourself? Um, I read Wooden Boat magazine because it kind of deals with craft like this. I saw a picture of this model of boat. Um, the designer is this fellow named Ian Otrid. He lives on the Isle of Skye. This boat is his Ness Yall design. I built this boat from a sheet of plans, of his plans. Um, you know, there's eight architectural, naval architectural uh, sheets that when I got it, I thought, oh boy, that was a nice dream to build a boat. Like, what am I gonna, I couldn't even, it was like, I couldn't read the, <laughs> the plans. I was like, oh man, this is too complicated. But like anything, I sat with it, read some books, read his manual and um, figured out how I would start. And so I started. Um, a little bit of background on this particular design. This is called a Shetland Isle beach boat. Although it's built in marine plywood, um, plywood, like nothing special, waterproof glue, held together with epoxy. Very modern, very contemporary, certainly since the 1950s or 60s, uh, post-World War II materials. This is not traditional. However, the lines are traditional. The, the dimensions of the straits, that's what each of these pieces are called, um, are traditional. So this is the shape, if not the um, same material um, of, a, of a traditional boat from the north of Scotland, the Shetland Isles. These guys, you know, I, I like to pat myself on the back for sailing the coast of Baja in this thing. These guys went 40 miles seaward in the North Atlantic year round to, to fish, I was gonna say surf, um, banks, um, these deep water, well, less deep water, the, the bottom would come up near and they, they would fish cod and uh, haddock and all these crazy North Atlantic fish in boats like this. And there would be, you know, one old guy, I like to think with a beard, um, uh, tending the teapot, you know, and, and the other guy, you know, they, they all had their jobs. There would be three of them in, in, in a boat like this, 40 miles seaward, um, they would fish, fill it up with fish, and, and come back. Um, there's a, a beautiful image. I, I love this kind of stuff. Um, each cove had their own fleet. And um, I forget. It's this book. Oh, Inshore Craft of uh, Britain, Britain and Scotland, Volumes 1 and 2. Um, I, I wish I had for you the, uh, the author's name, but um, I'm... I'll, I'll be glad to give it to you if you're interested. Um, this book is really interesting because it talks about all kinds of different designs, these Shetland Isle boats in, uh, included. But it also gives wonderful details like this one of a group of fishermen, three, two or three to a boat, um, maybe 15 or 20 boats going out in the morning singing hymns, you know, sailing in a group of, I mean, can you imagine? 15, 20, 25 of these boats and, and the voices, I just, in the right setting, it would really kind of like hit you, I think. It would kind of resonate. I think of like celestial coordinates or something, you know, that's, that's the beautiful thing about hymns, I think, in general. Um, but that's another topic.